Okay, let's uh, make a start now. It's quarter past. Welcome, everyone. It's a, a really great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Megan Scanlon. Uh, and Megan is a final year med student uh, in this university and a budding historian, medical historian, the next generation of medical historians. How cool is that? That's really, really good. So Megan is going to talk tonight about um, women in medicine, uh, a topic that she's been researching for some time. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Okay, so, um, yes, so during this talk, um, I'm going to be um, speaking about women in medicine um, from history. And I'll start by, I'm going to focus first on um, the, fir oh, sorry, the first um, three women up there on the slide um, who were prominent in um, Great Britain and also America. And then a bit later on I'll talk a bit about um, the two women at the end there who are a bit more, um, or who are from New Zealand and yeah, so hopefully along the way you can sort of um, get a bit of an appreciation for their stories and learn an interesting fact or two maybe, as I did when I was um, learning about these things. So to start off with, um, I'm going to begin by talking about um, a woman by the name of Elizabeth Blackwell. Um, so she was born in Bristol in England in 1821. and. And when she was 11 years old, her family immigrated to New York, in, um, New York City in America. And originally, as a young woman, she was um, a, she trained as a school teacher, and that was mainly because um, her family, after following the death of her father, um, their family struggled for money, and so her being a teacher was sort of um, important for earning. Um, the family's key. Um, however, she she um, got a her interest in medicine after a good friend of her hers had become unwell and had spent some time in the hospital in in a hospital in New York and had said to her that if if she had been able to um, have a female physician, that perhaps she may not have um, suffered as much as she did. And so Elizabeth um, sort of took this on board and um, felt that um, she would quite like to become a woman um, or become a doctor. Uh, so that was the beginning of her uh, um, looking into her, how she could go about doing this. And so she initially went off to um, Philadelphia and was staying with um, a staying with a family friend there by the name of Dr. William Elder and he um, helped her at the beginning by teaching her some um, anatomy and physiology and then she um, began by applying to medical schools in Philadelphia um, but she was sort of met with resistance almost anywhere um, she went and all of her applications um, were declined and the reason for this um, was that she, um, because she was a woman basically. Um, and most of the physicians um, interestingly said to her that um, she, she should either go to Paris and try her luck there or that she, the only other way would be to disguise herself as a man and um, study medicine. So she didn't want to do that, um, but yeah. So and then she so she went off to um, New York and tried there. Um, so after so after being in Philadelphia and being rejected by a number of universities there, um, she she returned to New York and eventually. Um, after studying privately anatomy and physiology, she was accepted into the Geneva Medical College, which was in upstate New York. And she studied there um, for her medical degree for two terms. And in between, um, in between the terms, she returned to Philadelphia, um, where she applied to um, get some clinical experience at this um, 
charity hospital in Philadelphia called Blockley Elms House and they were initially kind of um, reluctant to have her there um, as she, um, but she kind of managed to get her foot in the door and then actually um, she really enjoyed her time there and sort of gained the respect of other clinicians while she was there. Um, although she, um, by the time um, she finished her summer there, there was still some young sort of young residents um, that would refuse to um, see her patients if she um, wanted to speak to them about um, her Okay, so in, um, in 1849, uh, she eventually received her um, medical degree from Geneva Medical College, and that, um, so it made her the first woman in America to do so. Um, in April of the same year that she graduated, uh, she decided to continue her studies in Europe. And so after, um, after visiting a few hospitals in um, Britain, she then went on to Paris. Um, her experience there was um, similar um, to her experience in America, and she um, was rejected by many of the hospitals um, based on her gender. But in, in June of that year, she um, re um, had enrolled in a, um, in a maternity hospital in Paris. Uh, however, the condition was that she could work there, but um, they would only treat her as a student midwife and um, not as a physician. And however, she took up this um, post regardless of that condition. Um, and s unfortunately for Elizabeth, um, while she was working at this hospital in, in Paris, and she, she was treating a, um, an infant with... Um, ophthalmia neonatorium and somehow and I'm not exactly sure how but she uh, ended up getting some of the um, infected serum in her own eye and she actually um, contracted the infection and subsequently lost the sight in her eye and had to have it surgically removed and replaced with a glass eye which was um, yeah it was quite sad um, but so after after a period of sort of recovery from from that in happening in um, Paris, she headed off to London and began working at St Bartholomew's Hospital. And there's just the two images of both of St Bartholomew's, and that image there um, is of of a Mr James Paget, who at the time was a very um, prominent um, general surgeon and pathologist and there's a couple of diseases named after him. Um, yes, sorry, so while she was at Bay, um, St Bartholomew's, she made quite an, a positive um, impression, um, but she did sort of meet some opposition um, on, on the wards every now and then. Um, Elizabeth, however, felt that uh, the prejudice against women in medicine um, was not as strong back in, in America. So um, in 1851, so after a couple of years in, in London, she decided to head back to New York. Okay. So a few years after arriving back in, in New York, she established her own um, small dispensary in, in Manhattan and three years later, in 1857, um, her, she established, uh, along with her younger sister Emily, who during her time away had also um, earned a degree in medicine, they um, expanded the original dispensary, which is, um, yeah, they expanded the original dispensary to become the New York Infirmary for um, Indignant Women and Children, which is this um, building here. There. Um, and so, but during um, during this time of establishing with her sister um, the infirmary, she was also travelling back and forth um, between New York and London. And her the aim of her trips back to London um, were mainly to sort of 
raise awareness and funds for um, the progression of um, women in medicine um, over in Britain. And it happened that um, in, so when on one of her trips um, back to Britain, she was able to actually register herself on the um, the General Medical Council's um, register in Great Britain under a sort of clause in their medical act um, that allowed practitioners that had um, pre practiced prior to 1858 um, to register. And so she became, not only was she the first woman in America to earn a medical degree, but she became the first um, woman to register with the um, British on the British Medical Council Council's register, um, and then so she, or she came um, back, and then she came back to New York, um, and her sister uh, Emily and herself decided that they would set up alongside the um, infirmary. They would set up a medical college uh, for women, and so they did so. And this is the sort of title of the, um, the college that they set up um, adjacent <coughs> to the infirmary. Um, however, once they had they'd set up, so they had the infirmary which was busy and then also they'd set up the college, the, a sort of um, rift developed between the two sisters, Emily and Elizabeth, um, over how to sort of manage um, the two um, facilities. And then Elizabeth feeling slightly sort of alienated, um, decide that, decided that she would go um, back to Britain and um, work on establishing medical education for women there. And so in 1869, um, she sailed for Britain. And then, so after um, arriving back in London, about five years later, uh, she went on to co-found the London School of Medicine for Women and that was alongside two other prominent female physicians of the time, Sophia Jex Blake and Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who I talk about in the, um, who I talk about shortly. Um, but after so after they established this um, School of Medicine for Women, um, Elizabeth Blackwell sort of lost much of her or authority to Sophia Jex Blake and they didn't really get along that well um, and so she resigned from her position as a senior lecturer um, at the school there in 1877 and that sort of officially marked the end of her, um, her end of her medical career um, and then later on she lived permanently in, um, in Britain um, and was still relatively active. Um, mainly, she was heavily involved in um, the reform movements, and in particular, in the moral reform um, sort of um, scene. Uh, she, in 1895, she published her own autobiography, and that was titled "Pioneer um, Pioneer Work in Opening the Medical Profession to Women," and it didn't do very well, unfortunately. Um, and then after then she sort of slowly relinquished her um, public reform presence and spent a lot more time travelling. Um, and Dr Elizabeth Blackwell um, passed away in her home in Hastings, Sussex um, at the age of 89 in 1910. <coughs> so that brings me to talk now about um, Dr Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. So um, Elizabeth was born, another Elizabeth, was born in 1836 in a place called Whitechapel in London. Um, she was originally educated as a young child by a governess that was employed by her family. And then she was later um, sent to a private boarding school for ladies in Blackheath in London, along with her sister. And she was just 13, that's the photo of the boarding school there. Um, so after receiving this sort of formal education um, as a young woman, uh, she spent the next nine years sort of learning domestic um, duties in the household. Um, but in her own time, she continued to um, study things like Latin um, and also arithmetic, and she um, she read very widely. 
Um, so in in one of the journals she um, did like to read, um, called the English Woman's Journal, uh, which was first published in 1858, uh, she read about a Dr Elizabeth Blackwell, who I was just um, talking about before, and um, she read how Elizabeth um, Blackwell had become the first woman doctor in America, and that she was um, due to be giving a talk in London. And so Elizabeth Garrett Anderson um, went off and travelled to London to hear um, Elizabeth Blackwell's lecture, and the title of the lecture was Medicine as a Profession for Ladies. Uh, so after having um, sort of got her inspiration for becoming um, a doctor from listening to Elizabeth Blackwell's um, talk, uh, Elizabeth decided first she would spend six months as in, um, working as a nurse in Middlesex Hospital in London here. And so while she was there, um, she made quite a good impression as a nurse and they let her go along to a couple of the outpatient um, clinics. And so she was sort of further developing her um, interest in the field. Um, and so while she was working, at, working as a nurse there, she was also um, had employed um, a professor privately to um, study um, anatomy and physiology with, um, and was also studying Latin and Greek. Um, and how we, so as she went on at the Middlesex Hospital, she sort of like gradually became um, involved and was able to go into the dissection rooms and the chemistry laboratories and things, but this sort of didn't sit well with the other male um, students that were there. And so um, they, they made like a petition thing um, to the university um, there saying that they weren't happy that this um, female student was allowed to be amongst their classes and learning and things and so she was um, unfortunately obliged to leave um, Middlesex Hospital but as she did um, she wa she did leave with an honours certificate in chemistry and materia medica so that was an achievement um, after after that she didn't certainly didn't give up and she applied to a lot of medical schools including um, Oxford, Cambridge, Glasgow, Edinburgh, St Andrews, um, and all of these unfortunately received, um, refused her application. But after she had um, gained these certificates in um, uh, chemistry and materia medica, she was able, she was accepted by um, the Society of Apothecaries and um, in 1862, she began her medical training there. So, after after two years of studying, um, she she was able to get her license to practice medicine, um, in 1865, um, and she took the exam that day, and it was herself and only six other. Um, men who took the exam, and three only three of them passed, and she passed with the highest marks. Um, and so now she had a license to practice medicine. Um, she found that she wasn't actually really able to take up any um, medical post um, in any hospital in London. Um, so she decided that she would open her own practice. Um, and after opening her private practice in um, Upper Berkeley Street in London, her, um, the numbers of patients she had um, continued to grow. And later on, the dispensary became known as the New Hospital um, for Women and Children. And that's the... And as I mentioned earlier, she was also involved in 1874 um, in, the, um, found it, in the founding of the London School of Medicine, along with the two other um, women doctors.
and Elizabeth Garrett Anderson served as um, as the dean of the London School of Medicine for nineteen years. Um, so, also another um, sort of interesting thing I learned about um, this woman when I was researching was that um, she was not only the first um, female physician in Great Britain, but she was also the first female elected the first female mayor of. Um, and that was of Aldeburg, which was her hometown. And um, further to that, her father had also been the mayor there um, 30 years earlier. And so she, yeah, so she was the first um, female doctor and the first female um, mayor in England, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and then, so uh, later on, sort of, um, she, her, her legacy kind of lives on, I guess, in um, the fact that she has a, um, a, the wing of University College um, Hospital is named after her, and they, um, it's a wing specialising in obstetrics and gynaecology, which was um, something she was very much interested in. And so that's, uh, that's the wing that is there today. And so um, another important person to um, discuss is Dr. Sophia Jex Blake. And so she was um, also born in London in 1840 um, and is probably most um, remembered for her pioneering campaign um, to obtain admission to the University of Edinburgh, um, not just for herself but for um, six other women who became known as collectively as the Edinburgh Seven. Um, so as a um, as a young a young woman, um, she had been on a trip um, to America to learn about education for women, and whilst there, she had worked at the New England Hospital um, for Women and Children for some time as an assistant, and it was there that she decided that she would like to become a doctor. Um, in 1867, she wrote directly uh, to the, the president of Harvard University asking if she could um, come to their medical school. Um, and she re received a reply um, from them a month later, and the letter stated um, that there is no provision for the education of women, women in any department of this university. However, she, didn't, she um, definitely didn't give up there. And so the following year, she had hoped to attend the medical college that um, that Elizabeth Blackwell and her sister Emily had started, adjacent to the infirmary, the infirmary in New York, who I talked about a little while ago now. Um, but unfortunately um, for um, Sophia, her her father had died, and she was needed to head back to England to support her mother. And so she, she couldn't attend the, the new college that Blackwell had set up in New York. But when she was back in, um, in Britain, she was still determined to seek her medical education. Um, and she, so she applied herself to study medicine at, um, at Edinburgh University in 1869, um, thinking that she'd been sort of advised that Scotland, um, if anywhere, would be... Um, would be the, the place that would allow um, women to study at the university. And um, on a, so the medical faculty, when she applied, actually voted in favour of her, um, of allowing her to study medicine. But unfortunately, the university court um, rejected her application. And the grounds for that was, um, they said that the university um, was not was not willing to make the arrangements um, the necessary arrangements in the interest of just one um, lady and so also not giving up um, Dr. Oh, Sophia Jex Blake um, decided that perhaps if if they weren't willing to make the arrangements for just her then you know they, they might be persuaded to do so if, if she had a few um, other people join her, and so she advertised in the national um, newspaper, The Scotsman, for other um, women to join her in applying for medicine, and six other people wrote to her, and so they submitted a, um, an application, 
and this time it was accepted. And so the Edinburgh University became the first um, university in Great Britain to accept um, female students. And so, um, and just um, sort of briefly about the Edinburgh Seven. So I haven't um, gone through individually um, who they each of their stories, but so there were seven women, and in, in, in general, um, they were all mostly sort of well-educated women from families um, that were, I, I guess, quite well off, but also um, where like learning and education was a uh, very important like um, factor, and um, yeah, and that um, education was valued in their families. Um, regardless of gender. And so, and well, so it became known what um, as the Edinburgh um, Edinburgh Seven sort of campaign. And one of the important events sort of that happened that I thought was worth talking about um, was um, what's become known as the Surgeons Hall riot. And so this. The picture here, this is a picture of the Surgeon's Hall, which is where um, the students all would study their anatomy. And the story is that um, they were all, um, the class was due to um, take their anatomy exam that day. And so it was, uh, it was an afternoon of, fr of 18th of November, and the woman. Um, were due to sit the anatomy museum at this hall, and so they they had a, had approached um, the hall and found that there was a crowd of people um, sort of blocking um, the street, about several hundred um, people. And as they um, were approaching, uh, quite a lot of the crowd um, began sort of pelting them with rubbish and mud, as well as shouting um, insults and, the, and abuse at them. And as they um, made their way to the main entrance of the surgeon's um, hall, uh, the, the crowd had um, slammed the gates, the gates shut um, in front of them. And so they, this sort of went on until one, um, one of the sympathetic sort of students came to their rescue um, and let them in. And after, so they still sat the exam that day, and then after, afterwards, instead of sort of sneaking out the back, the, um, the seven women sort of refused to do that, and they came um, and exited out the front, um, of, out the front of the building. And the Surgeon's Hall riot, sort of as it's now become known, was sort of like a, I guess, sort of a landmark sort of event um, for their campaign, because although it was kind of horrible for them at the time, it sort of won quite a lot, quite a lot of attention from, um, I guess, the wider public, and also um, won them quite a, a lot of supporters within their own classmates, as, um, as a lot of the other male students sort of saw how badly they were treated, and, um, and so eventually um, they sort of, acted um, um, became sort of like protective of these seven um, women who were in their class um, and in fact in the weeks that followed um, the, some of their male classmates would escort them to and from their classes and so after um, so after the surgeons hall riot um, they continued on doing their study and they, they were all doing um, really quite well, achieving um, highly in their, in, in their courses. Um, but in 1873, as they were about to, or in due to graduate, um, there was um, the university um, put through, there was, there was a court case and um, it was decided it was ruled that the woman should not have been um, admitted to the university in the first place, and so their degrees were. Um, it was said that they were um, not able to to graduate with their um, medical degrees, and so they all seven all seven of them um, had to leave 
after four years of study without without their degrees. Um, after this disappointment, Sophia headed back to London, and um, that was when, in 1874, she was involved with forming the London School of Medicine, with the other two women. Um, and then eventually, most of the Edinburgh Seven, or in fact all of them, um, eventually did um, graduate with medical degrees, but from other universities in Europe and not in Great Britain. So Sophia Jex Blake um, herself graduated from the University of Bern in 1877 with her medical degree. Um, later on, she she went back to Edinburgh and opened up a private practice there that eventually sort of grew and um, became the Edinburgh Hospital and Dispensary for Women. Um, and today, still outside the medical school at University of Edinburgh is a a plaque for um, Sophia Jex Blake yeah. and um, it reads on it that she was a physician, a pioneer of medical education for women in Britain and alumna of the university. So, um, yeah. And so now I thought um, because it has come up um, quite a bit this um, London School of Medicine that I would um, talk a wee bit more about how it came to be. So as I said, it was established in, um, in 1874 um, through an association of the three women that I've just been talking about. Um, and then, so that was the, the school as it was first established. And then about three years later in 1877, they formed a, a, well, a relationship was um, reached with um, the Royal Free Hospital, which was also in London, um, so that the woman um, that was studying at the this, at this school would be able to do their um, clinical uh, learning and attachments at the Royal Free Hospital. Um, and so the, the Royal Free Hospital had was at that time the first hospital to allow women in to um, observe on the wards and it sort of re maintained this um, relationship um, or, or this sorry this reputation for um, many years up until quite recently where you know it was um, known to be a hospital um, that had a lot of women um, students and practitioners um, there. Uh, and so later, while um, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson was the dean of the school, um, it amalgamated and became part of the University of London. And that, at that time, it changed its name to become the London Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine for Women. So that's there. And then um, sometime after that, it again, um, it um, again, amalgamated with the University College Hospitals Medical School um, and eventually has been renamed the University College London Medical School or UCL and that was just in 2008. <coughs> um, so that's in most recent um, times. And so now I would kind of change um, a wee bit and talk um, about some women that are a bit closer to us um, here in New Zealand. <coughs> and so Emily Seedberg um, was born in Clyde um, in 1873, and her mum um, her mum was Irish and her dad was a Jewish German architect, and they had come um, out to New Zealand um, earlier in 1861 to pursue um, mining in Central Otago. And when Emily was three years old, they settled um, in Dunedin as her dad, and her dad um, became quite a successful building contractor um, in Dunedin. So she was first, um, she went to primary school at the um, normal school in Dunedin, and then later on attended Otago Girls High School. Um, where she had a broad scholarship. And so from, um, from a young age, her dad had um, 
she, well, she had accepted her father's sort of wish that, or his thinking that she should, it would be a good idea if she um, became a doctor. Um, and she was quite happy with this. And so um, with a lot of her father's support, um, they set about, um, after she'd finished high school, set about getting um, her entry to Otago Medical School. Um, when they first approached, I guess there, there, um, there were few um, sort of people in the school at the time um, that were, I guess, enthusiastic about it. But they, the overall sort of um, reception um, wasn't as hostile as um, things like what it was like in, um, in Britain at that um, earlier time. Um, and the University Council in Otago had already decided themselves that um, it should be allowed that both w women and men um, should be able to go to medical school. Um, and the Dean at the time was um, Dr John Scott and he was um, quite reluctant <coughs> but he was prepared to pledge his support for Emily to um, attend the medical school and then eventually um, it was the, the hospital medical staff in the end, um, albeit grudgingly, um, obliged to the university's decision. And so in 1891, she became the first female medical student in New Zealand. Um, so just um, apparently, so later on in life, um, when Emily, uh, she sort of, would, when she talked about her time as a student, um, she made, well, kind of like made light really of um, her time as a student in terms of um, any sort of antagonism that she had come across. Um, and she, it's written that um, she said that her colleagues were quite well behaved um, young men, and the worst that it had got was that sometimes they would be um, in the dissection room and some foreign objects would come her way uh, a bit more often than they did for other students um, and it was yeah so she, but she uh, it's also in reading <coughs> a bit wide, more widely about her um, she sort of felt though at the time quite a sense of um, responsibility and um, things in terms of being the only woman medical student there at the time she felt that she sort of um, yeah, had a, um, a sense of responsibility and so she was quite glad in her second year um, when another and one of her friends um, entered the medical program who I'll talk about soon but so after um, so Emily graduated um, with her medical degree in 1896 and for the first uh, very short time she um, worked as a locum at the Seacliff Asylum um, here in Dunedin and it was for only about a month before um, she set off overseas to complete postgraduate studies in um, obstetrics, gynaecology and um, children's diseases and she studied whilst overseas mainly at Rotunda Hospital in Dublin and then also um, in Berlin. And so, and after after her sort of year away studying and doing a bit of work, um, she returned to Dunedin at the end of 1897, and decided the following year she opened up her own um, private practice in one of her dad's houses in York Place, and she would um, sort of main, she would maintain her private practice in Dunedin for 30 years. And so that's her private practice there. Um, Another sort of important role that um, Emily's held um, during her medical career was um, her role as superintendent of medical superintendent at St Helens Hospital in Dunedin, which was a maternity hospital um, here. And she was she served there as the superintendent um, from its opening in 1905 to until it closed in 1938. Um, while she was there, she um, was um, very instrumental in, um, in it getting a very um, well-known um, reputation and a good reputation for, um, for its maternity services and she was also um, heavily involved 
with the training of midwives and also the Ponca Society. <coughs> so um, Dr. Cedarberg was also quite active um, in, the com in the community and also in welfare work. And she was a, she was a founding member of the Dunedin, the Dunedin branch of the New Zealand Society for the Protection of Women and Children. And she was the president of, this, um, of the Dunedin branch of the society for 15 years. And she was also, in 1921, um, the founder of the New Zealand Women's Medical Association. Um, so, deservingly, she, um, there's a street um, not far from here, just near the university and hospital, um, that was named in her honour. It's called Emily Cedarberg Place. Um, and there's also, there's a plaque just below it there. So that that's the street name and then that's just on the footpath um, below. Um, she also um, received other honours. She was um, awarded a life membership of the New Zealand branch of the British Medical Association um, and was also a life member of the New Zealand Registered Nurses Association. And um, she was awarded um, also in 1935 a King George V Silver Jubilee um, Medal and also she received a, um, a CBE in 1949. And this um, here is a picture of um, Emily, which um, hangs in just as you walk into the first floor of the medical library um, across the road from the hospital. And it's certainly, I think, a picture that I've walked past many, many times. And um, yeah, I've always quite admired it. And so, yeah. There. And so I just wanted to talk um, because I thought it was quite interesting when I was reading and um, I thought what was this St Helens Hospital and so then I, I um, did a bit of reading about it and thought it would be it's a kind of interesting thing to share. So one of, um, obviously one of her major roles <coughs> that she had was um, being in charge of the St Helens Hospital. In the history of um, this was that, and there was the Midwives Act in like 1904, um, which basically meant that the government um, at the time decided that they would open like seven government-owned um, or state-owned state maternity hospitals, and the purpose of these was to primarily it was to train um, midwives um, and also to you know to serve the wives of working men. And it was, they were, I thought it was quite interesting, they were um, named St. Helens um, after, the birth, after the place in Lancashire, which was the birthplace of this man the, who was the Prime Minister at the time, Richard Seddon. Um, and so there were hospital. there were seven of them. There was um, Hospital of St. Helens in Auckland, Christchurch, Dunedin, Gisborne, Invercargill, Wanganui and Wellington. And the first one opened in 1905 in Wellington, um, and the last one was opened in Wanganui in um, 1921. So the Dunedin one was opened in 1905, at the end of 1905, and um, its location was on Regent Road, which is so it's in North Dunedin, like it's like Park Street in the in the night and day, and yeah, it sort of goes up that way, um, and so. Yes, and so sorry, it was yeah, it was opened in nineteen oh five and eventually closed in nineteen thirty eight when Queen Mary Maternity Hospital was opened. Um, the interesting thing I thought was that um, so from its opening, its purpose was to train um, was for the training of midwives, um, but at the time when it was opened in Dunedin, the the medical school. Um, was led by um, a man named Dr. Um, Ferdinand Batchelor, and he was um, he was really keen that medical students from the university would um, should um, be allowed to go to St. Helens and do the obstetrical um, clinical experience and training. Um, but the they were really against this, especially um, the Prime Minister um, Richard Seddon. Um, who, who resisted this, and he really didn't 
think that it was appropriate um, that married women would be attended by medical students. And so um, instead, the uh, hospital known as the Bachelors Hospital um, was set up in Dunedin um, on 4th Street to um, allow the medical students to train there while the midwives, um, midwifery students tra trained at St Helens. Um, but by the time in 1920, there wasn't enough cases um, in the Bachelors Hospital, and so eventually um, they were they did allow medical students um, into St Helens um, to train, and so Dunedin was the first um, the first city that allowed the medical students into um, the hospital, and this was um, followed a bit later on, a couple of years later, in Wellington and Christchurch, um, and then. Basically, like as time went on, the services um, at the St Helens hospitals were sort of incorporated into um, larger hospitals, and as like the DHBs started to form and things, um, yeah, and so um, they were gradually closed and incorporated into other hospitals. And the last um, St Helens closed um, in um, 1990 in Auckland. Um, so, just quickly back to um, Emily. Uh, so she, so like I said, she decided to um, operate her private practice out of. Um, so she started in one of her father's um, homes in York Place, um, and then um, later, later on, he um, he died um, suddenly. Her father died suddenly, and about half six months after that, um, she. Uh, approached an architect in Dunedin and um, decided to commission a, um, a new house to be built in front of the old family home in York Place. And so um, this was, uh, so in 1903, um, five years after she started her the original private practice in her father's, um, the, in the original family home, um, this house was built um, and that was originally numbered 59 York Place, but is today it's 75 York Place, it was renumbered. Um, but interestingly, yeah, so it's still um, completely um, there and looks pretty much just the same as it. But um, in recent times, it's again um, become um, a place of medical practice. And in fact, it's now um, on the um, ground floor is the Dr. Safari, um, Appearance Medicine Clinic, and the doctor that owns and runs that is also a graduate of Otago Medical School. So it's pretty interesting. Um, and then, just the last um, sort of just couple of fun facts about um, Dr. Cedarberg is that um, she really liked her motor car, and this is a picture. It's not the actual one, but a picture of the motor car she owned. It was a um, Clement Bayard motor car, and she was one of the first people in Dunedin to have um, to have a, a car. And she was, um, I thought it was quite funny. She was once um, like ticketed for driving it faster than a walking pace, um, but she that was something she she successfully defended this, so she didn't have to pay the ticket um, in court. But she um, she drove well into her eighties, and this is so. This was the original picture. It was yellow. Her car, this one too. Um, and she also delivered um, the famous New Zealand writer Janet Frame, and that was at St Helens Hospital in 1924. And I come to just to finish. Um, I'll quickly talk about. Um, another important person um, by the name of Margaret Cruikshank. Um, so Margaret had been born in Palmerston in 1873 and she was um, she had five younger sis, um, siblings and was also a twin. Um, so her and her twin sister graduated as joint ducks of Otago Girls um, High School and then um, Margaret went on to followed her friend um, from school, Emily Sederberg. Um, to medical school um, in, in Otago. 
Um, and so she graduated with her degree just the year after Emily did um, in 1897. But she was actually, um, she actually became the first, she's known as the first registered female um, medical practitioner in New Zealand because Emily had gone, immediately gone overseas, um, but Margaret had stayed around and registered the year before. Um, she, uh, aside from one year overseas um, studying in um, Dublin and in, in Edinburgh, she worked for her entire life in Waimete in general practice. Um, and so she was, um, she was pretty um, busy, especially, um, so this is, sorry, this is Waimete Hospital here, and she, um, Margaret was very busy over the um, war time is her the partner of the um, the hospital or the practice um, had enlisted and gone off to um, fight in the war and so she just sort of took on the patient load of just about sort of everyone in the town and she was also um, heavily involved with um, the red the effort of the Red Cross in Waimete um, and then later on in 1918 and um, when the the influenza um, pandem pandemic hit, um, she again sort of stepped up and was um, not only providing um, the necessary medical care for um, a great number of patients, but she was also known to um, go above and beyond and it's um, sort of written that she would um, often be doing other things to help like, um, you know, feeding other um, Fam like helping with um, other families, babies, children mil um, and children, milking cows um, for if the people were sick and couldn't do it. Um, and so um, it was, it's quite a sad story really that in um, later on, in I think it was in, oh she, she caught influenza herself um, and um, sadly passed away of pneumonia um, in Waimete at only at the age of only 45, so sad. And, um, but in gratitude of her work um, in service in, in Waimete, um, there's a marble statue that was erected there in the township in 1923. Um, and on it, um, I think it's quite nice words, uh, is um, engraved, the beloved f physician faithful unto death. Yeah, that was her story. So, hmm. um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. I'm really sorry if it's not it's my first time doing a presentation, so I was a bit nervous. But um, yeah, thanks for coming along and listening. And if you have any um, questions, or or you can say now, or um, yeah, I've got my email there. And, um, Okay, there we go. Any questions? Megan. Oh. Okay, Tom. Megan, thanks for your talk. Do you think female medical students experience any gender based discrimination these days? Um, that's a good question. I think certainly over my you know, like nearly six years now, I don't think there has actually been a time where I've, I've felt like there has been any sort of thing like that. but. I don't know whether I'm just sort of oblivious to things or no. I, I don't think so. I think um, Otago is yeah. I've I've never come across it myself when um, being a female medical student. I think we're all treated um, the same. And in fact, like I think there's probably more in my class. I like there's a lot more girls than or women than men. Yeah. Was the discrimination of Edinburgh back in 1877 only against medical studies or all studies? Um, well, I know of, um, so I probably yet yeah, know that there was definitely um, the stuff going on with the medical school, but it sounds, uh, I probably would think it was in general, as like they, that the Edinburgh Seven were the first um, woman to be admitted to the university, like full stop into any university in Great Britain so I assume like maybe you know it was the same for other things but I think um, 
the general thing was like it was okay to like study things like arts and languages and things, but the medical side of things was a bit um, different. Yeah. The, 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 most of them went to Europe to mm. do postgraduate work. Yeah. Did you get the impression that European universities were fairly liberal at the time? Yeah, I think um, yeah. From sort of my reading around it is is that yeah, if they if they stood any sort of, sort of chance, it was definitely in the Europe, not in the UK or Great Britain. It was more yeah in the wider Europe. Yeah. yeah they were so, so the people that you spoke about didn't have any trouble getting postgraduate experience. No, no, Europe, they seem to yeah go off um, yeah to quite a number of European universities yeah. with not so much trouble, but the um, in within Great Britain it was yeah. more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you just tell us what subsequently happened in Otago? Was there again drips and drabs, just the occasional female come along, uh, and then they exploded in the numbers exploded in the 60s, 70s, or yeah. did they increase enormously in the 20s, 30s? Um, that's a good question. I think I'd have to look a little bit more, but I think in general after these, like every year, just kind of, there was one and two, and then just slowly became more and more. I couldn't say exactly when it sort of, you know, like, became... Um, if there was like a real like huge surge or it just sort of, but I, from what I read, it sort of seemed like it just steadily grew that more women were following on from these two women. Yeah. I think one of the difficulties was for them to find employment, which is why they mm. ended up being self-employed. Yes, yeah. Because people wouldn't actually employ them. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, was it um, Eliz yes, uh, so Elizabeth Gary Anderson, the second Elizabeth that I talked about, um, she had gotten the license and that was all well and good, but then you know she just couldn't get a job anywhere, so the only option was for them to start their own private practice. And so I think, yeah, so all three, that's sort of what they did, and then that eventually grew into their hospitals. Um, yeah, so I think over the years it's definitely um, been increasing and I think now uh, we are above 50% of the cohort, I believe, like our female, um, yes, uh, yeah, so it's, it's now above 50% of that intake is female. Um, I think, yeah, and then it's interesting, you can look at the, um, they do have the statistics of breakdowns of like specialties and things, male and female, which is another interesting thing to look at. Questions? You talked about the Edinburgh oh. Seven, oh, sorry, the Edinburgh Seven, and um, mm. they all ended up qualifying eventually, mm. and they got to work in medicine. Yes, yes, all of the, yeah, they all qualified eventually. A couple of them, um, never practiced because they subsequent they did that and then they found like a husband or and mm. became did the um, <coughs> did have children and things but yet they were all qualified yeah great that was sort of my question Megan was um, it, it seemed from your talk that these women were sort of dedicated to medicine mm. and I was just wondering if there was any family if they had relationships yeah. or partners or children. Yeah, um, so Elizabeth Gary Anderson did. She had um, three children and was um, married. And then, um, but Elizabeth Blackwell, she was kind of quite well known for being, she was quite a personality, I guess. And so she, she never married and um, wrote quite um, a lot about how she just didn't need to, wasn't interested in that sort of thing. Um, and so she never did. She dedicated a lot of her life to first the medical stuff and then she went on and uh, was quite influential in the, the sort of lots of different reform um, movements in the UK. And then Sophia, uh, Sophia I think, she, oh she actually had, a, um, she had another, she was, had another, she had another female partner actually, um, Sophia did and they yeah, lived together 
and, and travelled a lot in their retirement. But yeah, they weren't. They probably did sort of have to. They did sac. Well, I'm not sure if it was sacrifice, but you know, like mm. they didn't have big families and things like. They did spend a lot of their time pursuing. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Christian. Well, Megan, uh, once again, uh, wonderful, wonderful presentation, really, really interesting. Please join me in thanking Megan. <laughs> Actually, I just sort of add, you're now a, a, off on your academic career, you're a published author now, aren't you? you oh, yeah. You, you, yes. You, you, this uh, paper yeah, I've was pu first published, was published recently, so. Yes, Megan's yeah. Megan's a published author now <laughs> as well. Yeah, I just put it, it was just a, like an article. Um, in the New Zealand Medical Students Journal, if you ever, yeah, it's like a condensed format of this. <laughs> yeah. cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>